Hello, and welcome to the AAMFT Podcast. Your all-access pass to the latest news developments and thought leaders in the world of systemic therapy. We strive to relate, educate, and innovate one episode at a time. I'm your host, Dr. Eli Karam, and we're brought to you by the American Association for Marriage and Family Therapy. Our podcast explores topics that relationship-based therapists care about. In addition to featuring unique conversations and interviews with established experts, our show provides information and education on direct practice and emerging trends in the MFT profession. For more information, please visit us at aamft.org. Thanks for listening and enjoy the show. Hey, welcome back to episode number two of the AAMFT podcast. Thanks so much for the early but positive feedback last week to our debut installment. And today is a continuation, part two of our interview with Dr. Sue Johnson, the founder of Emotionally Focused Therapy, also known as EFT. As you can tell here on the podcast, we go under the surface. We're not talking about the steps and the stages of the interventions of the model. We're talking about the person behind the model. You're not going to hear Sue Johnson give an interview quite like this anywhere else. So last week you heard her talk about her relationship with her mother and father and her family of origin experience growing up. Today you'll hear her talk about her current relationships and what she is most proud of and what she still has left to accomplish in her career. So this, these pioneer interviews is just one unique aspect of our show. In the weeks to come, you'll also get cutting edge trends and clinical innovations in the field of MFT. You'll be hearing from industry leaders as well as previewing what's happening in the AA MFT. Remember, there's over 50,000 MFTs in the country. Roughly about half of those belong to AA MFT. So while you don't have to be a member of the American Association for Marriage and Family Therapy to benefit from this podcast. Membership sure does have these privileges. So in weeks to come, we'll be hearing what is on tap for 2019. And we certainly hope you'll drop us a line. You can get a hold of us at communications at amft.org for email. Also, the Twitter handle is the AAMFT. Sit back and enjoy part two of the Susan Johnson interview. And you know, but I have two children that I kind of grew up who are both adopted, a son and a daughter. I did not know that. Yes, and I also have uh, another daughter who started out being, it was my husband's daughter from another marriage, and she only lived with us for a year when we were first got married and decided to go back to live with her mum. And but I'm I'm very close to her now, and she actually lives here in Victoria, and I have a grandchild. And I even have another sort of child in that um, we have a young woman who didn't have anywhere to live, who came to live with us about seven years ago, and still lives with us, and I think of her as my daughter too. So I have have three daughters and one son. (laughs) That's great. And... um, but let's take my daughter that I adopted from Peru. What is interesting about that relationship, I'm not sure how my, my mother plays into that, but what's interesting about that relationship is that my daughter, and I don't think she'd mind me saying this, she's an introvert and she struggles a lot with social anxiety and she's a withdrawer. And of course, I am the opposite of a withdrawer. I am out there pursuer, right? I want you to engage with me. I want you to dance with me, right? That's what turns me on. So her and I have um, got kind of stuck, especially in her early adolescence, because no one can freeze me out like my daughter can. (laughs) The ultimate distancer, yeah. That's right, and... um, I would, it would be very, I think it was good for me. It was good. It, I think it's good for us all as clinicians to realize that no matter how many skills we have and insights we have and how much we learn, when it comes to our own relationships, we, we're just human beings 
caught and we get caught in the same places that our clients get caught and we get hurt and we get reactive and we get scared and um, you know we're just we're just human beings so her and I have had a interesting time together um, she's taught me a lot I'm very pleased to say we we kind of started to lose each other a couple of times there as she grew up but now I think we're fine and I'm I I'm my relationship with my kids is is one of the great joys of my life so I think when when I think about me growing up uh, my mother taught me to be a fighter she also showed me about the extremes of, of the drama between people because she was could be wild and very scary but I had so much secure attachment from my dad and my granny that it gave me what John Bowlby would call a secure base. Yeah. And I think I have been lucky enough. Um, you know, I've been married more than once. I came here to Canada. I married an American and I was blessed, I guess. Um, Hollis was a, a lovely, lovely man. I, I don't think I was ready to be married. In fact, I said I'm not ready to be married, but he was kind of out determined to marry me. So I sort of stopped fighting after a while. And we were together for about nine years and we grew each other up and we did not damage each other or wound each other. We kind of grew in different directions and then had to make an incredibly painful decision, I guess it was my decision, um, that we really shouldn't be life partners even though we loved each other. And that was very difficult. It was a huge risk for me to, to let go of him. But, um, you know, I've had some dear, dear friends and, and the, the men that I've been involved with have basically been very good for me and I've, I've just had my 30th wedding anniversary with my husband now. Congratulations. And thank you. And he's been um, an amazing blessing in my life. So, you know, uh, but I also think, and we talked about this the other day, my work in EFT, which continued to develop over the years and especially when I really got into attachment theory and science it took off my work in eft has most definitely definitely helped me with my kids with my friends and especially with my partner over our lifetime you know we're like every other couple we get stuck we hurt each other's feelings um I don't know, you know, where we'd be if I hadn't been in EFT. And my husband is a very open, flexible man, bless his heart. And we're both very strong personalities. So, so you know, um, but we can dance together. But we were talking about the fact that we, we've both benefited from the work. Yeah, I mean, the model is such that if you if you're not in touch with your own vulnerable areas it's very hard unless you're uh centered in that way to be able to help couples get to another level so so clearly uh, one of the things i think that makes you accessible is you do share so much of your story and i appreciate you sharing us you know with your your transition from your first marriage into your second i guess it would take a fairly uh secure person too to have a Sue Johnson for a spouse in the sense that uh, <laughs> they would have to be a pretty, have a pretty strong sense of self and, and be comfortable sharing their vulnerability. Uh, is, is he a, uh, is he a kind of extrovert as well, or is he more of a, an introvert? Um, he's an extrovert. In fact, um, when I first met him, um, my two closest girlfriends warned me about him and said, um, uh, this guy is too much. He comes in too fast, too close. He's in your face. He's intrusive. Um, he, he pushes our boundaries. 
you know, he, we think he's dangerous. And I said, oh, that's what I like about him. <laughs> yeah, right, right. He was so, a, tr- a true match for you. Now, uh, also, you know, our, our listeners like to know not only about the personal stuff, but like how you do grow in your own uh, therapy through mistakes, through things that didn't work out. And I always say like watching EFT, it is both an art and a science. And yes. it is something that even if technically you know the the stages and the steps, it takes time. And you have to have the you have to have the right, you know, that's why I like longer sessions when I'm doing EFT work. It, uh, you get more time for to create the event, to heighten, to do all those things. Talk about both uh, we always like stories. What you know, seminal moments where you learned, and maybe it was studying those tapes, and maybe it's even more recently where you learned from things that didn't go so well that helped you become uh, a, a better emotionally focused therapist. Okay, um, I think I want to say first that what made a huge difference in in EFT was that um, adult attachment as a science grew at the same time as EFT. And I tuned into that. And so whenever I'm working with a couple, I have the interventions from Rogers and Minuti and I have the intervention map, but I have a, a map that's all about adult attachment that grounds me. And even when I'm off, when I'm somehow, wait a minute, how do we get here? I'm lost or I'm losing my lives with this person or things are going wrong. Why, why am I up here? Right? I go back to my understanding of the basic emotional trauma that's happening in a relationship and its attachment that guides me there. So well, I, I, I go, yeah. I'm grounded in that, right? But I, I'm course, glad you brought that up because some, some of our listeners will think that EFT and they think of, you know, if they play word association, the first thing they think of is attachment. But those earliest writings um, attachment was not part of the framework until you brought it in later. And I uh, often heard you say Bowlby wanted to call attachment theory the theory of love, but no one would take him seriously. But it's such a, a beautiful fit, almost like peanut butter and jelly, uh, uh, kind of fitting uh, together with how we view relationships. When in our timeline, if you started in 86, when did you bring the attachment framework into EFT? Um, I think... I knew something powerful was happening in EFT, and I knew I didn't quite understand it. And it wasn't enough for me to just look at Rogers. I Somehow I needed a bigger framework. And I remember going to a conference. I, I talked about this in the literature. Um, and it was actually listening to Neil Jacobson, and he was talking about how um, a love relationship is a deal. It's a bargain. And so what you do is you teach people negotiation skills and you help them get the best bargain. And he said, you can bargain for everything. You can bargain for affairs. You can bargain for everything. And um, it was totally clear to me that he was completely wrong. <laughs> but I couldn't put my finger on it. And then it came to me in this kind of um, epiphany, if you like. You know, it came to me in this epiphany. Well, if it's not, if it's not, a bargain, what is it? And I thought, my God, it's a bond. And the whole of John Bowlby's stuff on mother and child played out in my head. I thought, my God, it's an attachment bond. And that started it. And I wrote Bonds and Bargains. Actually, it was pretty soon after my dissertation because that, that article came out in 86 and it was very difficult to get it published. I wrote Bonds and Bargains, um, in, and it came out in 86. So the attachment was there, came in pretty soon, um, but adult attachment was really not, it wasn't developed very much. You know, it, it took until, oh, I don't know, what are we now? I always think it only really been going adult attachment in the last, 12 years, 15, 12 years, people have started to listen to it. When I first used to say um, a romantic relationship is um, kind of structured in the same way in many ways as a, a mother and child bond, people used to walk out of the room. 
They used to say you're talking, you know, you're talking about um, codependency. You're talking about fusion, merger. You know, th this is nonsense. Adults don't do this. And it's taken a long time for people to get the concept of constructive dependency. And or, that, you know, I like the word uh, interdependence. Not, it's not codependent. Yeah. It's not. It's, it's like you know, you can go out and experience the world but then you know you can come back to your safe base and they'll take you for your good and your bad and you can share that with them it is it is a beautiful kind of natural intuitive framework that clients no matter whether they're high functioning or lower functioning they, they get it so it, it fits so beautifully so since you're such a good storyteller tell us tell us a, a either a funny story or a story where you really learned a lot um there's so many of those, um, you know, um, when I think of what I was just into was remembering being at an AMFP conference and standing up and talking about attachment, standing up and talking about emotion and about a third of the people left the room and then I stood up and talked about um, attachment and how vulnerability denied is not strength. What is strength is vulnerability that you can turn to somebody and share, and the other third of the audience left the room. And what I remember is there was some sort of, um, I don't know what you call it, existential choice or something, where what happened to me was inside me, some part of me said, give this up. Nobody wants this. Nobody likes this. This threatens people. Um, you're going against the grain. Who do you think you are? Give this up. And actually what came up for me was I thought I'll go and do depression research. Okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but then there's another part of me, which is the fighter from my mom that said, the hell I will. The hell I will. This is real. I see this in my office every day. This is real. I'm going to stay here. So that's what sort of came up for me around, you know, choice points. And then, of course, about I did stay there and continue to write about attachment and kind of about three or four years later, suddenly, you know, people started listening and my wonderful attachment colleagues would ask me to conferences. And But, you know, the thing is, you need a map to work with couples. You need to understand the structure of relationship and what is at stake for people. You need to understand the emotional music, right? And um, all that's true, but we are complicated human beings. And, you know, any time you walk in with a couple, you're dealing with two people and the way they dance together, you're always going to get stuck and make mistakes. I think one of the places that we need most to have support from our colleagues and know that we have a base that on is when we're working with traumatized folks. Yeah, I can remember, um, you know, not that long ago, working with a man. I'll I don't, I'll call him I'll call him John. Okay, and um, basically he came from the military psychiatrist, and they said nobody can do anything with this man. He has massive PTSD, but we've also given him five other diagnoses, and he's impossible, and he's been through all kinds of war experiences, but he's now going to leave the military. He stopped drinking about six months ago, and he's impossible, and we're scared that if his wife leaves him, um, he's going to commit suicide. So in Canada right now, um, there's a huge panic about the number of military who are committing suicide. So it was going on back then, which is a few years ago. And I saw this man... And um, indeed, he was a massively aggressive and hostile. His wife was accommodating, constantly trying to be kind, not responding to his attack. And he would sit in my office. He'd been a very powerful man in the military. So he was used to sort of taking the floor. He'd sit in my office and he'd berate her tell her how disappointing she'd been as a partner, how um, he was, and the main thing was that he was sure that she'd had an affair 30 years before, and he outlined all his 
fantasies about that she hadn't really just gone for coffee with this fellow student. She'd had a full-blown affair, and that's why he'd withdrawn from her. And you know, um, and he'd just yell and scream and shout and call her a whore. And so I tried all my best EFT skills. <laughs> And nothing happened. We were appalled to find that, you know, nothing, that the power of the, the negative dog doesn't necessarily care how, how clever we are. So nothing happened. And of course, after about two sessions of this, uh, I started to feel very protective of his wife, who would finally just duck down while he berated her. And then he'd attack me and tell me that, I was a stupid therapist. I'd never been to war, which of course is fair game. I never have been to war, but I've dealt with a lot of people who have. And um, I was losing my cool. I was um, driving home thinking about getting back at the military psychiatrist that had sent him to me. <laughs> mm -hmm. You know, um, I was blaming him in my head. And um, I was actually beginning to blow it with him, I think, because I was doing what everyone else was doing, which is reacting to his rage and his huge... Up. He would weep for his own pain, and then he would turn and basically cut his wife's legs off. Mm -hmm. And he wouldn't listen to her, and he wouldn't listen to me, and, and it was hopeless. And I did what I usually do in that situation, um, which is I go away and I ground myself in attack, the attachment vision of who we are as human beings. I try to attune to this person, you know, what would I have to be feeling to be doing this? I basically assume that everything we do is perfectly rational if we understand people's pain and their fear and their desperation. So um, I think I'd had three sessions with him and things were going to hell. The Alliance was going to hell. Um, you know, it, it didn't help that they kept changing his meds either. That didn't help. And then I kind of found my place and I went back in and talked about the fact that what I understood was that the only person who had ever been there for him in his life was his wife. But that in fact, he never totally felt sure of her. And there were all kinds of reasons for that, which I won't go into now. But that now when he stopped drinking and all his terrible nightmares of the battlefield and all his hurt had come back to find him, he was basically casting around in the dark, looking for a lifeline. So naturally, the only lifeline he had was his wife. And so suddenly he was checking if there was a crack in this lifeline. And, and of course, he's vigilant as hell, so he finds a crack. The crack is she must have had an affair with that guy all those years ago. I decided it back then, and I'm right. And it's all about the crack in the lifeline. And I start talking about that this is his desperation. He looks for the crack because if he cannot be trusted, then... And these are the existential fears that come up in couple and family therapy so easily. They're all there in the drama. If she cannot be trusted, then what? And he looks at me and he's totally silent. All the time I've been talking about this, he hasn't interrupted me once. I say, could you help me, John? I think if you'll allow me, if she can't be trusted, if she can't prove to you she didn't have this affair, then what that means is that you're alone and you've always been alone and you'll always be alone and that's unbearable. And he said, yes, that's right. And he began to weep and the whole relationship between him and me 
shifted and the therapy shifted and we started to be able to work on his negativity and how terrified he was. And what that says to me is what it always says to me when I get stuck, which is um, attachment is a safe base for therapists. Attachment is the way to, to safe and sound. Attachment always tells us the route home. So when I get lost, I go back to my model. I go back to the focusing on the emotion. I go back to reflecting what's happening in front of me, my basic skills, and I go back to understanding human beings as attachment bonding mammals who must have this safe connection. It's the only thing that gets us through the night. It's the only thing that ever has. And, you know, um, it's interesting because one of the last people I interviewed um, in the last little while was Mnuchin. And um, I had some nice interactions with him. He was very old by this point. Yep. And one of the things he said to me, which I really appreciated, he said it more than once, actually, over the last few years. He said, um, I don't like attachment. <laughs> 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 and, and I said, that's because you don't understand it, Sal. <laughs> so he took that, which always surprised me. And then he said, but I like Sue's work, and I think I make big mistakes. Bless his heart that he could say that. I so respect that. He said, I think I make big mistakes. I didn't see the emotion. I didn't know how to work with the emotion. And him and me... I said, yes, Sal, you made a big mistake, but you were wonderful anyway. Okay, so, so you know, we had this kind of thing. Um, and I don't know why I'm telling you that. No, no, it's, it's, it's a wonderful, you said so many things uh, that were, I mean, if you just listen to that story of you with John, the client, you get a really window uh, in how congruent your work is with your model and your base of attachment. One of the things I find with doing EFT and one of the, when you when you tap into primary emotion and when you create an event like that, it is one of the singly best feelings I believe you can have as a therapist. And yes. it's a real feeling, and you can you can see it, uh, you can feel it. It can comes through across the uh, if, if you're taping your work, if you're a student, if you if your supervisor's in there with you. It's an amazing thing. However, the one of the things kind of using kind of the language of the model to fit with that, that when you get someone to really go like when you were reacting to John you were reacting to a lot of his secondary emotion which triggers all of us which is how as you said everybody reacted to him but once you tapped to that primary emotion once you saw that vulnerability and you made that connection for him it was uh, like a whole new world was open for him so it was a powerful story one of the things I think is challenging in learning to do EFT is that you can have a moment like that and you can bring a client and, and, and they'll give you a couple minutes of vulnerability but even if you are uh creating this connection and creating this secure base, they can't stay in that vulnerability very long. So it's very common uh, people experiencing the model for the first time, therapists in training and even more seasoned clinicians, they get frustrated because they can't get them back there or they can't stay there. But I kind of say developmentally, that's that's kind of normal. You got to have little moments of vulnerability like that before you that's can right. have larger moments. But that story really, uh, you know, typified a lot uh, about and the I work think, and, and, and why you're so good at it because I think still that part of you even though you know you are a scientist practitioner in the science you mentioned Mnuchin and I think of Mnuchin and the development of the field uh, certainly uh, he was a showman and uh, part of the, the the golden age of family therapy in the 1970s was putting on these live dazzling demos and you didn't need empirical proof for your work but I think one of the things you as this uh, kind of transcendent character in our field of both the art and the science and that you love showing your work, being with couples, and you certainly do that uh, as well as anybody, but you also have an empirical base behind your work. And that has made, that has what had brought EFT to the dance, so to speak, and that has made it, you know, one of our most uh, evidence-based couples approaches around. It is the art and the science. So when you think, Sue, uh, we've had a, a great talk this afternoon, when you think of kind of how you want to be remembered uh, and the legacy of your work and the model, I'm curious what you want that to be. And I also want 
uh, our listeners who are really hearing you for the first time that have read your books and have only seen you in a textbook or something like that, what is another thing about you that you can't get from reading a book, a journal article that you think is really core to who you are and how you'd like to be remembered? I think what is the most core about me is that I grew up in a very small world in some ways in a little English town, even though the pub was quite a circus. And some part of me when I was little decided that I, never mind the risk and the danger, I was going to make a big world for myself. I was going to find out how to really be alive. And I think I'm always drawn to what makes me really alive, makes me feel alive, whether it's interactions with people, which it always surprises you if you're really attuned to people. Um, you know, I don't want EFT to just help people become better friends or not in conflict. I want EFT to be what I think it is, actually. It's, it's a way of growing people, bringing people, you know, couples, when they change their relationship, they grow each other. Um, I want EFT to be a vehicle for what Rogers said, which is therapy is supposed to be able to take people into a new sense of aliveness. That's what I've always thought in my life. And that's what we should be doing in therapy, not just addressing symptoms. We should be looking at people as wholes. In terms of legacy, um, I've just written a new book. It's coming out in January with Guilford. And it um, attachment theory and practice, individual uh, EFP with individuals, couples and families. So I'm applying this to individuals. And I think my legacy, hopefully in psychotherapy, my legacy would be that emotion is incredibly powerful and it's the therapist's friend. If you know how to use it, how to understand it, um, it's the most powerful route to change. And that the way forward for psychotherapy in general, not just couple and family therapy, is to base psychotherapy as a field on attachment science, to base the way we change people on who people are, our most basic nature. I would like that to be part of my legacy. I started out um, just wanting to understand and create a good couple therapy. And then I think it grew into me wanting to, if I'm being honest, change the field of couple therapy because I think people desperately need help with their relationships. And if we don't do our work properly, we can actually lead them into more pain and more distress. Um, but if you ask me now, there's also another piece, which is it's time for us as therapist to get on our bike and educate the public. It's time for us to impact society. Our society is forgetting how important relationships are and how precious and sacred they are. And it's time for us to turn and actively teach the public how to grow how to deal with being alive, which terrifies all of us, how to, you know, what we can offer them, how to understand love and loving. Um, we have a huge amount to give in this field. Um, you know, we, we, we just have so much to give. I kind of, well, if I look at what I've done in the last few years, EFT, we didn't just build a model, we built a community. There's 65 EFT centers all over the world, um, and we we build communities everywhere we go. It's like if we can get together and connect, if we can be a team and come together as a field, we can impact this culture. We can turn people back towards valuing connection and learning how to cooperate and collaborate um, if we don't connect, we're going to self-destruct. So um, this is all a bit big, but why not go for what's big in life? That's where the aliveness is, not hedging your bet, you know? So, so well said, and it's the, you know, we can come back later in 2019 and we can talk about the future of EFT. I would love to have you on again, but I, I think uh, another thing that 
makes EFT so popular is that you do. It is a community in the sense that you have uh, found a way to distribute your model. You know, you don't have to, it's not proprietary. You can go and buy Creating Connection. You can go and get Hold Me Tight, which is uh, wonderful. I think sometimes models, uh, they work on a clinical level, but then they're not distilled down to the general public. And I think EFT, you have, have a, it's a, another brilliant uh, way to market a model, uh, both for therapists, for the general public, to really educate them to this really universal language of attachment and emotion. And it's so wonderful to have you here, Sue, uh, as our first guest in this interview series. Um, again, your stuff is readily available. The book is coming out in January. Please take this time to tell us uh, anything else you want to about where to find the latest and greatest in EFT materials. <laughs> well, I hope that you'll read my book. It, it may be my last big fat academic book. I think I'm gonna write for the general public from now on. Uh, but I guess I just want to mention to people that our newest venture, which is a leap into what I'm talking about, that it's our responsibility as a field to educate the public, is we've just created, um, based on the book Hold Me Tight, we have an educational program, and we've just put it online. So hold, you can go to a, a website called Hold Me Tight Online and if in 20 years time, if you ask me where I would like to be when I'm amazingly old, sitting in my chair in the sun, I would like to know that anyone who really wants to understand love relationships and not just fall in and fall out, um, that they know they can go online and they can do our program or programs like it. They can do Hold Me Tight online and learn how to have their relationship, a good relationship. My parents never had that. They never had the chance. We can give that to people now. So I hope maybe when I'm old, I can look around and say, hey, we made a difference. We made, we created something that my son calls extremely funny therapy. <laughs> but we did more than that. We, we, we made a difference in our culture, in the world, in the way people see human beings and relationships. There it's been great it. fun to talk to you. It's been wonderful. Thank you so much. Sue Johnson, Emotionally Focused Therapy. And she certainly has made a difference. Thanks once again to Dr. Sue Johnson taking us behind the curtain into really a one-of-a-kind interview with a one-of-a-kind a leader in the field. Please uh, check out Sue's website for more information. And as she talked about in the interview there, you'll be able to get Attachment Theory and Practice, Emotionally Focused Therapy with Individuals, Couples, and Families. That was released earlier in January of 2019. If you like interviews like that, please stay tuned to the podcast as we will take you on a one-of-a-kind look with the people behind their models, including such MFT luminaries as Bill Doherty, Dick Schwartz, Harry Aponte, Chloe Madonis, and Fred Piercy. In addition... To these interviews, we will bring you the latest and greatest in emerging clinical trends, things that our listeners care about, topics like online therapy, becoming a culturally competent MFT, medical family therapy, attachment-based therapies. We'll also talk about emerging opportunities, including membership opportunities and leadership opportunities within the AMFT. If you're a professionally younger listener and you're navigating graduate school or moving towards licensure, we have episodes just for you as well. We'll work on things like the licensure exam, how to find a supervisor, landing your first job, all news you can use. And we appreciate hearing from you. A couple ways to get a hold of us. You can send us an email to communications at amft.org. You can also follow us, retweet us, help us promote the show on Twitter. Our handle is at the AMFT. Stay systemic, my friends.